Though I am, uh, must say, I'm a, I'm a little tired from a weekend of preparing for this morning and coming on to my second sermon today, I am still just overflowing in the joy of the Lord. This past week for me um, has just been very special. I've had just an incredible week um, in prayer with the Lord, and, and uh, it just puts things into perspective in a way that nothing else can. When you have time to step back and to remove yourself from the busyness of life and get to just be with God, perspective comes in such a a different way. And, and you know, it it really ties in well with what I want to share this morning. The title of my message is Walking Humbly with God. And I was thinking earlier that, you know what, here at this church, we're incredibly blessed by amazing musicians that lead us in worship every Sunday. We're blessed by Pastor Paul's powerful preaching Sunday in, Sunday out. We're blessed with incredible discipleship programs, outreaches within to our city. But you know, my prayer for us truly is that we wouldn't be known for those things. We celebrate those things absolutely, but those would not be the things that we would be known for. But instead, we would be known as a congregation of people who know and love their God, who walk humbly with him day in, day out, whether it's in a church service, whether it's at work, whether it's at school, no matter where it is. That is my prayer for us as a congregation, that we would be a people who know and love our God and walk humbly with him. In the 17th century, there was a a man originally named Nicholas Herman, and um, he grew up in France in a a poor family. They didn't have a whole lot, and uh, at a fairly young age, he went and joined the military so that he could have a, a place to sleep, and he could have three regular meals a day. But then at the age of 26, he felt the call of God to go and join a monastic community, So to go and live in a monastery. And when he went and he joined this monastic community, uh, he then took on the name which he's more commonly known as today as Brother Lawrence. Maybe you've heard of him before. Now he spent the rest of his life here in this, there in that monastery, but he never took a high position. As long as he had been there, as long as he had been Um, a part of that community, he remained a servant in the kitchen. That was his job. That's what he did for his entire life. Later on in his years, as he couldn't continue his work in the kitchen, he began to repair sandals, but always staying in this lowly position. No fame, no glory. Just a man who discovered how to live his life in constant communion with God, doing all things for the love of Christ. In the classic book, The Practice of the Presence of God, which is a book that was made after he had passed away, it's a collection of his letters and conversations that he had with people after he passed away, they made it into this book. It's called The Practice of the Presence of God, or Practicing the Presence of God. Um, I encourage you, if you've never read this book, it is life-changing, Just a small book, it's an easy read. I've I've read through it a couple times, but it is so incredible. It, It really gives a picture into this man's life, but the incredible wisdom that he had. In this book, it states that it, and it was observed that in the greatest hurry of business in the kitchen, he still preserved his recollection and heavenly mindness. He was never hasty nor loitering, but did each thing in its season with an, un, or with an even uninterrupted composure and tranquility of spirit. The time of business, said he, does not with me differ from the time of prayer. And in the noise and clatter of my kitchen, while several persons are at the same time calling for different things, I possess God in as great tranquility as if I were upon my knees at the blessed sacrament. And now I've never worked in a kitchen before, but I get the gist of what it's like. It's a, it's a busy, busy spot. There's a lot of things happening. 
there's deadlines, there's pressures, there's all of these things happening. And, and so to hear this testimony of this man that in the midst of all of that, he remained in this tranquil spirit, communing and communicating with his God. And it's fascinating that, that this man who was not searching acknowledgement or promotion People from all over France would come, church leaders and lay people alike, they would, they would travel to this monastery to visit him in the kitchen. This lowly servant, they would come for prayer and for spiritual guidance. And it's all because he knew what it was to walk humbly with his God. It was said that his very countenance was edifying, that there was just something radiating about him in the calmness of his spirit and who he was. There was a spiritual power and authority, not because of a title that was given to him, not because of any sort of status or position of any sort, but because simply he knew God. He walked with God. There's a good friend of mine who is an incredible musician and songwriter, and he wrote this song called Hank the Yodeling Ranger. It's an awesome song. But the song itself is about this man in whom he was related to. That was just a simple guy who used to walk house to house, door to door, telling people about Jesus. Faceless, nameless, no title. But it was said that they would even call him before they would call the ambulance to come and pray because of the authority that he had. It was said that this was a man that walked so closely with God. God heard his prayers in a special way, but it's not because of who he was. It's because he knew his God. See, in culture, we attribute things like giftings, charisma, financial wealth, platform, many other things as the measuring rod for success. These are the things that we pursue and that we celebrate in our culture. These are the things that we elevate above everything else. We wanna build a big business, we wanna build a big ministry, we wanna gain popularity and influence. And it's not that God doesn't call people into these things, but it comes down to what is the goal? What takes priority of our heart's desire? Certainly, God needs people, needs believers to have platforms. He needs people of influence and affluence with resources, absolutely. But he desires to place people in those positions because he has called them there for his glory. And yet equally as important, and this is crucial for us to understand, equally as important and certainly equally fulfilling, he wants people who live ordinary lives who have discovered the joy of doing even the smallest tasks for the love and glory of God. And as Christians, whether it be at McDonald's, whether it be in a warehouse, whether it be in the healthcare system, whether it be in a corporate office, we must be the best employees and the best bosses. And I truly believe that if we walk this out, the church in Moncton, in the workforce, that we would see absolute transformation. Colossians 3.23 even says, whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done for the Lord and not for people. In Matthew 20, Jesus says, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. This past week, uh, I watched the movie Gladiator. Any Gladiator fans here? A few. One of my favorite movies. But there's a particular scene in the movie that uh, really stuck with me, and it's near the start of the movie. Uh, Marcus Aurelius, who is the Roman emperor at the time, 
um, he's having a conversation with Maximus, who is the, the main character in the movie. And now Marcus Aurelius is getting up there in age, and he knows he doesn't have a whole lot of time left. And so he talks to Maximus, and he, he says this to him. He says, there is one more duty that I ask of you before you go. He says, I want you to become the protector of Rome after I die. I will empower you to one end alone, to give power back to the people of Rome and end the corruption that has crippled it. He says, will you accept this great honor that I offer to you? And Maximus, with no hesitation whatsoever, he says, with all my heart, no. Marcus looks at him and he says, Maximus, this is why it must be you. And I find that so profound. I find that so true when it comes to leadership. We need more leaders who are in place, not because they necessarily wanted to be, but because they were appointed by God and they responded in obedience to him. And we also need more Christians who are content in whatever circumstance they find themselves in because they know that their first and most important calling is to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love their neighbor as themselves. We complicate the Christian walk so often. We complicate life in general so often. We busy ourselves, we preoccupy, our, preoccupy ourselves, we distract ourselves, we run here, we run there, we give ourselves to everything else. Even in church life, I loved what Pastor Eli said last week when he said, talking about the Great Commission and sharing the gospel, that the reality is that some people might even need to do less volunteering in order to step into that. Because the reality is, is that as great and important as volunteering in the church is, what's of greater and a higher calling is to just simply walk with God humbly. True leadership doesn't come from a title. It comes from the depth of a person's character that is developed from walking humbly with their God. True spiritual power comes from knowing God. Leadership isn't something that you give to yourself. It's something that people give to you. We're going to look at Micah chapter 6, verses 6 to 8. We'll have it on the screen. It says this. It says, what can we bring to the Lord? Should we bring him burnt offerings? Should we bow before God most high with offerings of yearly calves? Should we offer him thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for our sins? No. O oh, people, the Lord has told you what is good. And this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. The prophet Micah asks the question, what is important? What should I bring to God? What is required of me? And to contrast what God actually requires, he lists things like bringing to God burnt offerings or offerings of rams and oil and and. You know, some of these things were actually things that God did instruct the Jewish people to do. In the Old Testament, before Christ came, these were methods of worship, bringing burnt offerings and so on. But they simply were methods. And so what is Micah saying? He's saying a method of worship without a heart of worship is empty and pointless. A spiritual activity without walking in relationship with God is not what he desires. King David understood this when he said in Psalm 51, you do not desire a sacrifice or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. This was in a time when King David had just gone through some pretty serious sin in his own life. 
But he grasped this understanding that it wasn't going to be methods of worship that were going to change anything. It was so much deeper than that. He knew that it had to come from a brokenness in him, recognizing that it was God and God alone that could actually bring restoration into his life. And so how does this look in our context of what Micah is saying here? You know, we could say, God, don't you see that I'm, I'm serving on four volunteer teams? God, don't you see that I attend church every Sunday? God, I've been baptized. Don't you know how many people I've prayed for? On and on we can go. But the Lord says, yes, but where's your affection for me when you're at home in the evening? When you're going about your business of the day? In all the doing of our church life, in all the doing of our family life, in all the doing of our work life, let us not neglect the highest and most important calling that we would walk humbly with our God. And I must admit, for me, sometimes this is a challenge. I am kind of naturally a, a disciplined person, which is a, a good thing in, in certain situations, but the tendency can be that I know the things that I need to do in order to be in relationship with God. I, I do this, I do that, I work, I strive. And I try to keep that in check, but if I'm not careful, it can go into this place of works and misunderstanding the grace of God. God reminds me so subtly, so gently, that it's not about a checklist of spiritual activity. It's about walking with him hour by hour, minute by minute. You know, according to Stats Canada, 26% of people between the ages of 18 and 64 reported that most days they were extremely stressed. Extremely stressed. So I could only imagine what that number would be if we factored in moderate stress levels. Anxiety, loneliness, depression amongst Canadians, 30%. These are high numbers. Friends, I think for some of us, it might be time to take a little bit of a step back from all the pressures of life that we place upon ourselves. Shake from ourselves this attitude of more, 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 go, go, go. And this is an appeal to laziness of any sort. We are called to work hard. We are called to do things with excellence, absolutely. But we are called to do that in the context of balance within our life. And when it's always about the more, when it's always about the striving, when it's always about the building and the going and the running and the coming and the going, then where does God fit into the equation in this? Where is our time for him and to just be able to enjoy the beauties of life? You know, a simple life is a great thing. It really is. To just learn to enjoy the creation of this beautiful world that God has created, to learn to enjoy the presence of our families and the small things of life. We are so busy looking and building towards what's next, we miss out on the beautiful things that God has for us in this minute and in this moment. And of course, as we know, there's so many things that attribute to this in our culture with the advancement of technology and, and so on, but let us not allow these things to cripple our lives in a way that that just consumes everything. Over the last little while, this is, most times when I, when I preach on Sundays, it usually comes out of something that the Lord has been doing in my own life. And, and I'm discovering things about him as I've been learning to walk with him in the day-to-day -day and in the small things of life. God is revealing his heart to me in brand new, fresh ways. I am all about, and if you know me, I am all about set aside, intense, intentional prayer 100%. I've preached about that often. But if we also neglect the day-to-day -day communication with him in whatever we're doing, then we're missing a large portion of what it means to walk humbly with God and have relationship with him. 
because it's usually in those times of our day and times of life when we're not really expecting anything. Think about all the times where stress comes upon us or we all of a sudden find ourselves in a hard conversation or a hard situation or anger has risen up or pride has come in or any of these things come in. The reality is the beauty of walking with the Lord is that his presence and his peace is only a whisper away in those moments. And so cultivating a life that allows us, that, that is habitual for us to turn to him in the small things of life brings joy and peace and hope into areas that maybe we're not experiencing right now. Even the Apostle Paul speaking to the Thessalonians said, make it your goal to live a quiet life. If you find yourself discontent in your walk with the Lord or you find yourself struggling to find breakthrough, it might be advised to simplify your efforts and begin to just turn your attention to him in all things. Just that. Acknowledge his presence and turn your attention to him. Brother Lawrence said this. He said, if I were a preacher, I would preach nothing but practicing the presence of God. If I were to be responsible for guiding souls in the right direction, I would urge everyone to be aware of God's constant presence. If for no other reason than because his presence is a delight to our souls and spirits. What would it look like if we learned this art? I don't even want to call it an art because I believe it's how we were created to function. Brother Lawrence discovered it. And as I've read through his book, I've just been so inspired to think, why in the world have I been living my life the way that I've been living it for the past 35 years? Still genuinely knowing and loving God and walking in his grace, absolutely, but there's just so much more to experience when there's consistent communication and flow with his presence. If you are a follower of Christ, that means that the spirit of God lives within you, and no matter Where you are, whatever circumstance you find yourself in, no matter how dark things seem, the peace and joy of the Lord is just a whisper away. For the remainder of the morning time that we have together, we're going to look at Psalm 119. We're going to look at a few verses from Psalm 119. And so maybe you're here today and you've been listening to this and you're thinking, I do want to learn how to walk closely with God like this. I want to learn how to communicate with him throughout my day and build that life of walking in his presence consistently. Well, in these seven verses of Psalm 119, we were invited into the prayers of the psalmist, the one who wrote it. And over the last little while, these prayers have really been informing the way that I've been trying to cultivate a life of continual communion with the Lord. And I trust that there'll be a benefit to you as well. And uh, as we go through this, you'll just see how crucial it is for us to know the Word of God, for us to be in the Word of God. It's so crucial to hear the words that God has spoken in the Bible so that we may have continual conversation with Him. I mean, after all, how how do we talk to Him when we don't know what's happening on the other side of the conversation. But as we read the scripture, we begin to learn how to communicate with him every day. So Psalm 119, we'll go through this verse by verse, and in each one, there's a different prayer that you can bring into your daily life. Verse 33 says, Teach me, Lord, the way of your decrees, that I may follow it to the end. Teach me, Lord. And again, God has given us all that we need to know. He's given us his ways. He has taught us by his word. And as we open it up, he will teach us. The word of God is everything that we need to live a godly life, to follow him. Teach me, Lord, the ways of your decrees. Verse 34 says, give me understanding so that I may know or that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. So even deeper than just knowing God's ways, 
having a grasp and an understanding of why he has called us to live in a certain way or to do certain things. There's a depth of understanding that we can ask God for. We can ask God for understanding in certain situations that we find ourselves in. Lord, reveal to me what is going on in this. Show me what's happening. Show me your heart. Give me understanding to this circumstance. We can pray this prayer continually throughout the day. God, give me understanding. Verse 35, direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. And so not only does God teach us, not only does he give us understanding, but then he directs us. Another version of this says, lead me. So God takes us by the hand. He doesn't leave us to our own devices to just say, here, just go do it on your own strength. He says, I will guide you. I will lead you. And this can be our prayer every single day. Lord, direct me. Direct me in this hard conversation that I have. Direct me to people who need to hear hope, who need to be encouraged today. God, direct me in the tasks of my my job that I have to play out on a daily basis. Direct me in your ways. Verse 36 says, turn my heart towards your statutes and not towards selfish gain. We can pray and ask God to turn ourselves toward him. Another version says, incline my heart. Change my heart. Change my desire to what lines up with you and your character and who you are and what you want. We can pray this prayer. God, turn my heart toward your statutes. And on the flip side of that, verse 37, turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. We can pray that prayer of God, turn me away from the worthless things, the things that I don't even maybe know that are worthless, things that seem okay or culture says okay or whatever, but really are not life-giving. Lord, turn me away from those things so that I don't have to give my time to things that are of no value, but I can turn back to you. and My heart can be inclined to your ways. Verse 38 says, Fulfill your promise to your servant so that you may be feared. Fulfill your promise. If we were to do a a complete study through the Bible to develop a theology of prayer, we would quickly realize that prayer always happens in the context of covenant with God, meaning that it's always in relation to his promises and what he has already spoken. And so in prayer, we're simply asking God to do what he already said he wants to do or what he's already said that he's done. It's aligning ourselves with what God has already said. And that's why, again, I say knowing the word is so crucial so that we know what God's already said. And then we pray in accordance with that. We call out to him and say, God, fulfill the promise. Fulfill what you've already said. And as we do that, what happens is it actually changes us. It changes us because it's already in motion because God said it. But as we align ourselves with him and that promise, he comes in and he changes us to line up with it. Fulfill your promise to your servant. And lastly, verse 39, take away the disgrace I dread, for your laws are good. Take away the disgrace I dread, for your laws are good. The enemy has this desire always to remind us of our shortcomings, to remind us of our failures, to remind us of our sin or the things that we we know we fall short in. But when he does that, we can always come to our gracious Father and say, God, take away my disgrace. Take away my shame. Take away my guilt. Take away this sin in my life. And by his spirit, he comes and he does that. Teach me. Give me understanding. Direct me. Turn my heart toward. Turn my eyes away 
fulfill your promise and take away the, dis- the disgrace. These seven prayers alone can be so powerful in our everyday walk with the Lord. And I pray that these will be tools for you even throughout this week when you're driving in your car or you're, you're going about your business at work or you're walking down the hallway, whatever the case is, these are just, just simple examples and prompts that you can use just to continue your conversation with the Lord. And as you read the scriptures, as you read the Psalms, as you read some of the prophets, there's, there's so much in there that constantly we can be meditating on, we can be communing with God, and we can learn the same life that Brother Lawrence did of understanding and knowing his presence every second of the day. Personally, this is the life that I want to cultivate, and I'm so stirred to do so, and I'm, and I'm experiencing the joy that comes with that. But there's so much more. God just wants to bring us even deeper. We never get to a place where we've discovered all there is to discover with God. He's mysterious. He is beautiful. He's amazing. We can be in awe of him for the rest of our lives and then spend eternity with him in heaven. Amen? I'm going to invite the worship team to come and join me. And as we get ready to respond this morning, as the worship team comes and as they, they lead us again, I just want to encourage you just even to bring some of this just into practice right now. Whether it's praying some of those prayers and just saying, God, God, give me understanding to even what I just heard. God, open my eyes and ears to the things that were just talked about. God, guide me into how that actually applies to my life. See, it's so crucial that when we, when we hear the word of God, when we come to church on Sunday, that there's not just this, okay, we accomplished it. We can check that off our list and then go about our business. But it's so crucial to continue on in the conversation with God. Because we get to, to have so much meat when Pastor Paul comes and preaches and whoever's preaching, there's so much to take with us that we need to continue to meditate on it. And so just even as the as the worship team comes and we go back into worship and, and, and it can be easy to just go through the motions to sing the songs, the lyrics that are on the screen, and by all means do that, but do it in a way that it really is you praying to God and you speaking to him, not just the motions of singing a song. And these little acts that we begin to bring God into the small areas of life as we continuously do this, form a habit of it, I believe it brings full transformation into our lives.